All right. Um, hi, I'm Daisy Holman. Um, I'm at Google. Um, I like to mess around with C++ like many of you, and somehow I've made that into a series of talks that people seem to like, so I'm just going to keep giving them until people uh, stop liking them. So this is um, kind of following up on the talk I gave last year at CVPCon. Um, it is, uh, I've given a talk with this name several times this year, but not with the same content. I'm told that like a lot of people thought they shouldn't come because they'd already seen the talk with the same name. So maybe I should do better about naming my talk next time. Um, yeah, naming is hard though. So, uh, you know, uh, anyway, uh, I, I have completely new content for today. So if you were like about to leave because you're like, oh, I've seen this talk. Um, it's completely new content tailored for this conference. So hopefully um, we'll enjoy this. It's a little bit interactive too. I'm going to try and get like how people in the room feel about what I'm talking about and get some feedback and I can move through different sets of tricks. I have, um, uh, so yeah, I mean like we, we're just going to geek out about C++. Um, and sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. Um, because C++ is that way sometimes. But the main goal really is to learn something new about how C++ works. And uh, we're going to do that by using it in a way that's so bizarre that it'll stick in your mind. But these aren't really the ways you should do these things. Um, like these are just more or less the ways of remembering some core important principle that you should use, but you should use in a real software engineering context and not in these kind of joke, Twitter 25-liner posts. Um, and it's, it's also about kind of learning how to learn things. Um, it's about how to play uh, with the language. So it's more like, uh, you know, these are, this is, this is how I've learned most of what I know about C++ is opening up a Godbolt window, playing around with things that seem super bizarre. Um, this is how, to be quite honest, this is how a lot of the committee learns about C++. We will be sitting around at a coffee shop in the morning, someone will pull out a laptop and start messing around with some bizarre sequence of tokens in Godbolt and we'll all try and make sense of what it should do and like why all four compilers do something different. Um, and so I, I want to show by example really how I've learned about C++ and, and hope that that can inspire you to dig around in the language, have some fun with it, and then by doing so, get to the point where you have a mastery of the language that really makes it flow into your day-to-day -day work much more quickly. Uh, so yeah, I already said I gave part one of in at CPPCon 2021, and then at Meeting C++, and then it was talked about on CPPCast. I was really surprised that people were so excited about these things, but I'm like super delighted. This is like my favorite talk that I've ever written and given, and I, I so enjoy geeking out over things. Um, I feel like people are paying me to do a comedy routine about C++, and that's kind of amazing. Um, some of these, actually none of the ones I'm presenting today have been presented at conferences yet this year. I think one of them I talked to like a meetup online, but I don't think it was recorded. Um, the one that I plan to start with today at least, um, and then see where things go is one that I've written over the course of the past couple of days based on the kinds of questions people had at um, the different talks that I was at and the kinds of directions that those talks went. Um, there's at least one on here that I haven't posted to Twitter yet. I show it, showed it to Teamer yesterday morning and he was like, you should absolutely make that into a tweet. Um, so we'll see. I haven't gotten that together yet because I was like writing a talk. Um, <laughs> Disclaimers, uh, don't use these things in real code directly. Um, some of them I have actually seen in real code and that's like what inspired me to do this. But uh, in general, like this is not a software engineering talk. Well-written code should be unsurprising and the goal of these tricks is to be, that they're, to be so surprising that you'll remember them, right? Um, I definitely have a problem in my talks getting too into the weeds. Um, I, that was a criticism of me for years. 
I just kind of leaned into it. This talk is all weeds. Um, and it's kind of several mini talks. Uh, if you've seen this kind of talk from me before, you'll, get, you'll have some idea. Um, so here we go. Gives you some idea of how this is going to go. Um, I'm going to skip right to trick number five. Um, my slides are all online, so feel free to play around with them while I go. They're um, at this link down here, uh, dsh.fyi slash corecbp-2022. Um, so, and then these tweets are all on my Twitter. You're welcome to interact with them there. Ask questions about them on Twitter. I will answer them. I love interacting with questions on Twitter because it shows me what people are learning from my tweets. Um, so this is one that came up actually pretty recently and it's why I wanted to put it in this talk is uh, someone on Twitter was, as, as C++ Twitter is wont to do, someone was complaining, oh, why can't I partially specialize a concept? This is nonsense, partially specializing a concept. I can partially specialize a class. Why can't I partially specialize a concept? If none of those words make sense to you, hopefully they will in the next 30 minutes. I'm going to go over everything at a relatively basic level. And if all of those words make sense to you, hopefully you'll learn something over the next 30 minutes too, because there's some, some kind of cute stuff in here that you may not have thought of, may not have heard of. Uh, and it'll ho hopefully build a good foundation for how partial specialization works, how function overloading works, um, how subsumption works. So here's a, a slightly different version of this that um, I'll, it will make a lot more sense as to why I'm showing this rather than the tweet that I originally did here uh, in a few minutes or however long it takes us to get through this one. But um, this is a concept. If you're not familiar with concepts, we're going to do a review of that. Don't worry. Uh, if you are, you're going to look at this and be like, what the heck is going on here? Um, so you can, the, the trick is that you, you can't partially specialize a concept in C++, but you can use, an ex, use explicit template parameters with a lambda to get a similar effect. So we have this lambda here, this concept that uses a lambda. It has these explicit template parameters here, which is a new feature in C++20. It's amazing. I use it constantly, um, which probably says something bad about the kind of code I'm writing, but I, I still use it constantly. And it has a requires clause. And then it has an empty body, and we're calling it with the parameter to the kind of outside requires clause. Um, and I'm going to go over how all of that works. So if you didn't catch it that time, um, we'll go back over it. Um, and this is like an example of how this works, right? We have two overloads of a function. Um, these are both templates. These are function templates. Um, we have this compact function template syntax in C++20, which is great. I use it constantly whenever I can. I am going to mostly avoid it in this talk because I assume most of you are not using C++20 in your day-to-day -day work, and so the kind of requires clause notation will make much more sense. It is pretty counterintuitive that you could have a function template without the word template anywhere in it, um, but this is a compact notation for it. Um, and one of them is unconstrained, the bottom one, the auto, um, and the, the top one is constrained on this concept we just wrote. And um, then we have a main function, and we see that like, when we pass it an int, uh, we pass it a vector of something that, that has a uh, plus operator overload, we get um, hello world, and we pass it uh, a vector of something that doesn't have a plus operator overload, or if we were to pass it anything else, like an int, we'd get goodbye world. Um, so let's dive into what concepts are. Um, how many people have written a concept in a real piece of code in this room? That is more than I thought. That is awesome. I want to go work with y'all. Uh, wow, that's so cool. Um, how many people have written a concept in a fake piece of code? All the committee members. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, oh, I guess third question. How many people have written a constraint in code using like an able if or something before C++? Okay, so that's actually a, a fair number of you. Um, and the rest of you write way better code than the people who raise their hands, probably. Except for the people who raise their hands about actually writing concepts in real code, they probably write pretty great code because they like waited for the real thing to come. Um, so here's a concept. Basically, it has a set of expressions that have to be valid substitutions for the template parameter, right? Um, so what I mean by be, be valid substitutions, we should be able to, um, 
compile it without errors, right? Or without um, what are called Sphene safe errors. And we'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. Sphene substitution failure is not an error. It's probably something you've heard tossed around. But even people who like use that term on a daily basis, I found don't quite completely know what it means. Um, and certainly Sphene safe is a little bit uh, of a stronger term, but in general, the body of a requires clause is a Sphene safe context. So I'll, I'll actually show you how you can accidentally make a non Sphene safe context in the body of a requires clause. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, and then we can use this. Oh, wow, I misspelled template. Um, you can tell I thoroughly tested my code. Um, and you can use this a number of ways. Here's one way to constrain. Um, a template, right? You just stick the concept in the spot where you would have put class, right? That was kind of the original way people thought we were going to use them. And then we realized that we needed more complicated clauses, so we needed to also, you could put them in a requires clause. Um, so I'll go over that in a second, but here's what happens when you call this, right? So, you know, std vector of int doesn't have an operator overload, operator plus overloaded, so like substituting std vector of int in here for t would cause this not to compile, right? If, if t is an instance of sid vector event, right? Um, whereas substituting int here, um, if t is an instance of int, then this compiles fine, right? It compiles, it's a valid expression. That's the general idea behind concepts, and they don't get a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, the case I showed on the previous slide is something that pretty much no one would ever do with a concept um, but it illustrates a point of the, the breadth of things you could do with concepts, right? You can put any expression in there and see if it actually is a substitution failure. Uh, it does still have to parse. It has to be valid C++ that you could parse, but it doesn't have to be a valid substitution um, for most of the types you pass to it, right? It's, it, it, the program won't fail to compile if you try to check a concept on something that doesn't fit into the, that, um, those expressions. Um, so there's an alternative notation. The most explicit way you can write a concept constraint is like this. Um, and in this context, you can see that concepts are basically just Boolean expressions, right? They're just saying that like something after this first requires here needs to evaluate to true in order for this overload to participate in overload resolution. And I spelled template wrong again. Wow, I hope I didn't copy paste that too many places because um, this is going to bug me. Um, and then there's also this compact notation where you have to put auto after it. So the idea behind this compact notation is like that auto is like the unconstrained template and then like adding a concept name in front of it makes it more constrained. So you can actually also use this in an assignment, right? And that will do a concept check on the right-hand side of the assignment. Um, or not assignment, but actually a, a declaration, right? Um, and, okay, so let's talk about partial specialization. Like, in general, C++ has had partial specialization since 1998. This is something, who's used partial specialization of a template in their code base before? Should probably be most people. The ones that didn't raise their hands are probably super lucky because that means that, like, you're writing very basic C++ and, um, in some extent, to some extent, that makes life easier. And, and to be clear, like I said at the beginning, everything in this talk, I'm a very pro big proponent of writing simple C++. But that's not what everyone does. And in a professional environment, you're going to encounter things like this. You need to understand them. Like, as your career advances, in general, you're going to see these things. So, and sometimes it's, just the, it's, sometimes it's just the right way to write something, right? Sometimes the writing it differently would end up with so much code that's not maintainable um, that you take the sacrifice that some of the people reading your code will not be quite as familiar with that, that mechanism and will have to learn it, but in the balance, people will be able to maintain the code better because you had to repeat yourself less or something like that, right? So always think about who's reading the code and how they're going to read it when you write code and, and make these balances. But partial specialization is a somewhat advanced uh, topic in C++ uh, where you have some template and you want it to work differently for a specific set of parameters, right? 
So full specialization looks like this, right? You have this template with this open close brace, right? That looks like the less than greater than operator or something like that. Um, and uh, you're saying that when the template parameter is int here, we should use this definition of the type. And when it's anything else, we should use this definition of the type, right? Um, and so, right, if I instantiate this type and call the print method, um, I get unspecialized and full. Um, this is more or less what all of my examples are gonna look like. So if you have questions about like what I mean by this snippet of code, feel free to, to jump in like earlier. Um, so you can partially specialize a template by giving more specific values for some or all of its parameters, but still depend at least on one parameter. It doesn't have to be one of the original parameters, right? So here, I depend on a parameter, right? But, um, uh, but it's not, it's different from the original parameter, right? It is the template parameter of said vector that I'm depending on, right? And that's getting deduced um, from the fact that somebody instantiated this with a std vector, it pulls out and pattern matches this, this u against the instantiation of std vector u. Um, and I get this. By the way, one of the pitfalls of partial specialization, and I see this all the time, what happens if I try and instantiate foo with a vector that has a custom allocator? Can someone tell me? What will print do? What, what would print if I cut instantiated foo with a, given this definition? Shout it out. Awesome, everyone's following. Great, uh, yeah, so this is like, when you write partial specialization in this form, be careful about what you actually mean, right? Think about like, are, is this, does this specialization really apply to all allocators? Then really should, you should have parameterized it on this. One thing I recommend, actually, uh, when you're doing something like this, is um, if it's a template that you're not totally familiar with, or that might add some um, uh, that might add some default parameters at some point um, later on while someone's modifying, just put a parameter pack there, right? Just deduce it as a parameter pack. Um, it makes it hard to use in in certain contexts, right? You can figure out ways to get out of the parameter pack, but if you really just want to find out whether or not this thing is a vector, put a parameter pack there, get the value type out of the vector using the type trait of the, the vector itself, right? Don't use the template parameter and, and go from there. Um, so that's just side, you know, trick that is actually somewhat useful if you ever have to do this in real world. Um, so yeah, and, and in this case, right, if I instantiate this with a vector of double, call print. Um, partial specializations don't have to specialize much. Um, so we could have a partial specialization like this where the only difference from the primary template to the partial specialization is that uh, T is a reference, right? And because it can pattern match on the case where you've instantiated this with a reference like this, you will, um, you'll get this overload, right? You'll get this printing in ref. Concepts can be used as a part of partial specialization, okay? And so before C++20, you had to do this with um, like a defaulted temple parameter. You've probably seen that parameter named enable or something like that. And then you use an enable if clause. In C++20, um, we can just stick a requires clause there, right? So this doesn't look super specialized, right? Like the, the um, actual pattern right, that you're matching here is T, it looks unspecialized, but this is a constrained T, right? We've constrained it to only be things that match unsigned integral concept, right? And that means that it will try and substitute in to the unsigned integral concept. Um, this is in the concepts header uh, in C++20. And if it can't do that substitution, it can't use this overload. But if it can do that substitution, it will use, oh, sorry, I just said overload, this specialization. If it can use this definition, if it can use that concept, it will use this definition of the type. Um, 
I'm trying to be precise about my language here, um, but also like C++ has words that are very, very similar that are, that have important differences. And uh, if you're on YouTube, go down into the comments and people will be correcting me there. So um, yeah, which is awesome by the way, like you can get the right information in our community because people love to be precise and that's good. Um, just sometimes doing so on the fly is, is hard. Um, all right, so cute mini trick here. Uh, this is the one I haven't posted to Twitter yet, uh, but this kind of goes along the way with what we're talking about. Um, so like, who can shout out what's the simplest possible requires clause you could write? The dumbest possible one that would match something. Anyone have an idea? Requires true, all right. When would you ever use requires true? Hopefully never. But that's what this talk is about, hopefully never. Um, so as long as none of the other partial specializations are concept constrained, uh, or, or I should say are only concept constrained, which will be the case if you're working with a pre C++ 20 code base and all of a sudden you have C++ 20 available, you can shadow the unspecialized implementation um, using a trivial requires clause. Uh, so that looks like this. Um, if you were to say, have this in a header file that you can't modify, and put this in one of your project's mo uh, header files. Yes, see, committee people are laughing at this right now because they're like, why would you have ever done this? Why did we even allow this in the language? Um, it may be that by the time you're seeing this video, the committee has gotten together and say, we're, said, we're gonna forbid this. <laughs> but for now, it works. Um, so, yeah. Now, every time you instantiate bar, um, you get this definition. This is a great way to create um, ODR violations in your program, by the way. If you really want your program to be ill-formed, you can, you can do this. Um, but in theory, if every compilation unit, translation unit that you link to includes both of these header files, you can shadow the original definition and stick your own in there. Um, and, and this will hit new default, right? Because we matched this, this concept and it's more specialized than this one, right? So let's, let's deep dive on what it means to be more specialized. Uh, oh, so caveat obviously to this trick, if I then try and go say std integral, what's gonna happen here? Shout it out. Ambiguity. All right, yeah, you get an ambiguity. So bar event now won't compile because it matches both this one and this one, and there's no relationship between um, these two concepts. Now I think if I had been dumb enough to say this before we standardized concepts, maybe we would have talked about like true being the base concept that everything like uh, subsumes. That would have been actually kind of cool, I think. Um, we're gonna talk about subsumption in a second, if that word doesn't ring a bell. But for those who do, I think that would have been a really cool direction to go. Unfortunately, the standard's set in stone now and we can't do that because somebody could depend on this being an ambiguity and want, and then use this in a concept and expect it not to compile and then negate that concept. And then their code would break if we decided to make true the, the base concept. So we can't do that, but it would have been cool, right? Um, this is the problem with standardizing language. You make mistakes. Um, I'm not sure that was a mistake, by the way. Like this is a total abuse of the language, probably shouldn't work, but. Uh, anyway, also, please let me know if I'm talking too fast. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is my first time giving this kind of talk in um, a country where English is a second language, and I tend to get very excited. So um, just like, please like, like most of the time I prefer people not to interrupt me while I'm talking, but in general, if I'm talking too quickly, like interrupt me and be like, hey, slow down, like use this symbol, maybe. Um, so I apologize in advance um, and I will uh, try and be a little better about that. But I'm, I'm really excited about this stuff. This is like, uh, yeah, this is cool, this is fun, right? Um, so if you use the name concept and you use subsumption with this previous trick, right? So we have this requires true. And this is gonna get, get us some idea of how subsumption works, right? Um, so I use, if I use this, this 
really dumb, simple concept. It's named. Um, by the way, I could have used a parameter pack there. Fun fact, if you use a parameter pack there and do this, this thing that I'm about to show you, uh, Clang crashes. So, woohoo! Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I tweeted about it yesterday while I was writing this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, when you play with the language, you, you know you're doing it right when you break the compiler. Um, this will happen. Um, who's, out of curiosity, who has crashed a compiler? Not gotten, not, not gotten an error message, but gotten an internal compiler error, an ICE before? Oh, right, you're embedded developers, okay. But I forgot. There's a lot of embedded development here in, in Israel, right, as, as I understand? Yeah, I, I know embedded compilers are tricky in that way. Um, and that's no slam on embedded compiler developers. It's really hard to develop for that kind of diversity of architecture. Um, so now, if we getting back, getting back to this, right, we, we have the same, essentially this looks like what we did on the previous slide, right? I've just given a name to my useless concept true, right? Um, so this part all works the same. But now what if I do this? What if now I say requires std integral and true? What's gonna happen if I instantiate this with an int? It fixes it, right? I've disambiguated the situation, right? So now if I say buzz int and print, I get an integral. I get, I get the term integral. The, the output, wow, words are hard. Um, and I can also still do special, partial specializations that don't involve concepts, right? This still works too. Like all the code on this slide works. Um, so let's talk about what it means to be more specialized, right? So like this second concept here is more specialized than this one. And if I were to tell you the term more specialized and ask you to guess if the second one is more specialized than this first one, you probably would have guessed yes. The problem is that if I were to tell you the term more specialized and ask you to guess if this one is more specialized than this one, you probably also would have guessed yes. And there's a very good reason why we did this differently, and I'm gonna get into that in a second. Um, but basically, more specialized means that it's, in general, it's a, a partial specialization um, that is a better match for the template parameter. And better match is like really difficult to define and there's a huge amount of stuff in the standard and it's really easy to hit corner cases on this, but the corner cases are designed such that 99.9% .9 of the time, it means what you expect it to mean, right? Um, so don't be afraid to guess what it means. Check yourself by running it through a compiler and then just use it. Don't try and read the standard on this um, if you, you need to. Oh, yes? So why do I have two concepts here? And not new default. Yeah, so it won't it won't print both of them because it doesn't match both, right? So it can only have one definition. If it has two definitions, if it matches two definitions equally well, the program will not compile, right? That's the goal here is to be specific, right? This is not like inheritance where like you get one and the other, right? You only get one or the other, and if you get both for some reason. C++ says, you can't do that, I won't compile. Which I think in most cases is a good thing. That's exactly what you want. You don't want to accidentally get something that you didn't think you were getting. Um, because, you know, C++ never does that. Um, wow, I have a version upgrade on, great piece of software, by the way. Totally recommend this. Not sponsored or anything. Um, if you're watching the YouTube video, you'll can like pause and like look at it, but totally recommend that, by the way. Been using it for like a decade. Um, anyway, um, so more specialized, like if you look at this and I instantiate this with um, 
double ref, right? So we, we, have, we have three definitions here. We have the primary template, A. We have the uh, partial specialization that specializes uh, the first parameter on this pattern that includes a, a reference. And we um, have this, this third one. So if I um, instantiate this here, which, let's, let's just not even talk about ordering yet. Which two def, which, sorry, which, how many definitions does this match? One. Two. Exactly. Right? This is, there is one that is best, but it matches the primary template and this specialization, right? So it match, matches one specialization, but it matches, sorry, this specialization. It matches one specialization, it matches two definitions. So for splitting hairs here, you're both right, depending on whether I said the word specialization or definition correctly the first time I asked the question. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, so this prints B, right? And that's hopefully what you would expect. Is there someone who wouldn't have expected that in here? OK, awesome. Um, how many uh, definitions does this one match? Three, right? Matches all three. It, we could make T be int in the second one. Or we, in this one, it's already like fixed as int. So it matches three of these, right? And then like U is deduced here, right? U is, is completely unconstrained in all three of these definitions. And if I were to do this in a way that like one overload specializes U and one overload, no, sorry, sorry, one partial specialization, you're going to see why I'm mixing up with overloads in a second, because they're actually very similar. But one partial specialization specializes um, the first parameter and one does the second parameter. If we had that, we almost always you end up with ambiguities there. There's some special rules for like disambiguating these things, but generally you're unlikely to run into success trying to do multiple, like mixing specialized and unspecialized in different partial specializations. Um, so yeah this um, print C. Uh, so subsumption. Concepts that are more specific uh, can also be used with partial specialization without introducing ambiguity. Um, so looking at this code intuitively, which would you expect to be a better match for the, the best match for this one, A, B, or C? C, right? Like, if the language designers have done their job correctly, this should print C. And it does. Um, and if the language de designers have done their job correctly, what, is what should this print? B. And it does. Awesome. Um, what does more specific mean, though? Unfortunately, because Concepts are hard and category theory is hard. We couldn't make everything you'd expect to work work because you end up with like these unsolvable problems, right? So there was a point in time at which we wanted this to work for concepts. We had, um, and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong about this ever being wanted to work, but I think there was certainly an intuition that it would have been really cool if it did, right? So we have two definitions here, right? And this, this notation means that like, this is an expression that returns something that matches this, right? This is just a, a, an additional um, notation you can use with a requires clause. This is just like this expression has to substitute properly, and this is like this expression has to substitute properly, and the result has to be something that matches this concept, right? Um, so looking at these two concepts, um, and passing in the, this expression, intuitively, what would you expect this to print? C, right? Would have been really cool if C++ did that, right? Because the more specialized concept, the thing that is more specific about the type that I'm giving it should match. Uh, but unfortunately, this is an ambiguity and it doesn't compile. Um, and that's off the slide, of course, because, you know, this is what you get when you do HTML slides. Awesome. Um, but 
if you go online and like resize the window, you'll be able to see that this just says doesn't compile. Um, awesome. So yeah, and the reason for that is that subsumption must be explicit, right? So what I basically have to do is say that addable subsumes basic addable. And the way that I notate that something subsumes another concept is that I say it's this concept and something else, right? And the moment that I say it's this concept and something else, it means that, um, that it's more specific, right? So you saw in the previous slide where I said something and this true concept, right? The compiler can figure out that one is more specific than the other. Whereas if you have a freeform clause there and it's not named, you actually, the compiler can't figure that out. Um, Adi? I believe that if you say and true and true, that still only, it works like inheritance. It's not more specific. But uh, does somebody, probably Teamer is the person who could correct me on this. You don't know off the top of your head. Who else is in here who would know that off the top of their head? I kind of justified it because I had the same question. Yeah? Uh, if you do, do a name concept, but very true, which is true and Right, yeah. So if you do true and like the uppercase true and the the Boolean literal true, that will subsume, right? Because that is you've added an, an you've added an explicit clause to it, just like we did here, right? We did basic addable and we added a Boolean expression. So because C++ is awesome, we decided to use the keyword requires to mean two different things. Um, just like we did with no accept, which was also a great choice. Um, and in this context, requires introduces something that's effectively a Boolean. You can actually use it anywhere you would use a Boolean, right? Um, that's why you'll see people complaining about this requires requires, because the first requires introduces a requires clause, and the second one creates a Boolean expression. Um, right, so, so this, is, this is like, you know, the, the true and lowercase true case is, is, is like this. I think Adi was asking about uppercase true and uppercase true. I believe that does not introduce a further specialization, right? Repeating a concept. If you make it into its own concept, then yeah, that introduces a subsumption, right? Um, but yeah. Um, so, wow, what is this print? Um, did not test the screen ratio, I'm sorry. Um, so what does this print? Z of int dot print. Um, now that we fixed this. C, thank you. Yeah, this is, this is what you'd expect, right? So subsumption must be explicit. Um, let's talk briefly about function template partial specializa specialization. It looks like this trick is going to end up taking most of the time, which is fine because I think this is really like informative. Yeah? Does the sequence make any change? No. Yeah, so the sequence of the ampersands will technically be different um, concepts, right? So if you use the two of them in separate places, right, then you've created two different constraints, and it will say there's an ambiguity between the two constraints, right? Um, but there's no ordering between. For instance, let's take some template library, template like vector, and substitute it using this trick true. Yeah. Substitute in my compiling module and all the headers above it. Everywhere. It doesn't matter where, where they put this code. They can put it. Yes, right. it, it will, um, as long as all of the files you're linking to include that, right? The problem is if you're actually linking to the standard library. During linkage, you'll face problems. Yeah, during linkage, you'll face problems. That's why I said this is a great way to create ODR, one definition rule um, violations, which I'm not going to go into ODR violations, but it is a fun rabbit hole, let me tell you. Um, and probably one you will face in your career at some point. So maybe I'll do a trick about ODR violations sometime so that people get some idea of how those work. Um, but let's jump into this one. 
And this is my, this will get to my like least favorite aspect of early C++ error messages and like, I still don't know if this is fixed. Um, but this is like, has led to more bad code than I've, any other error message I've seen. It basically just says function template partial specialization is not allowed. Because that's something that someone, when they learn about partial specialization, they're like, oh good, I can do this with function templates too, right? No, and then they get this error message that's like function templates partial specialization and they're like, grr, I have to make this into a class and then do partial specialization that way. And that's absolutely not what you should do, right? Because the reason why function template partial specialization like this is not allowed is because we already have a mechanism for it. This doesn't compile, but you can like literally just remove four characters from this and it compiles fine, right? So the reason why we don't have function template partial specialization is because we already have overloading to cover most of the use cases. If you have, it, it doesn't cover the use case where you have the user giving explicit template parameters. But like my hot take slash pro tip here is don't do that. Don't do function calls where the user gives explicit template parameters. If you need some sort of constant, compile time constant for your function call, use a sentinel value. Like use um, like std integral constant as one of the regular runtime arguments and then deduce the type out of there. If you didn't follow that, that's totally fine. Um, if you're one of those people who complains about lack of function template partial specialization, you probably followed that exactly and can go get angry at me on Twitter and I'll like link to the last time I had that conversation on Twitter. Um, so yeah, this works fine. Anyway, um, hopefully that tangent didn't derail us too much, but let's talk about subsumption and overloading. And this is the, the, the great thing here, right, is that C++ is, is heavily designed around trying to do what you would expect. And the idea here is that subsumption in the context of overloading should work roughly the same as subsumption in the context of partial specialization. I believe there are some key differences, but they're super duper corner cases. And I really look forward to reading about them in the comments because I don't know them off the top of my head and didn't have time to try and put them into the talk. I'm not sure it would have been all that helpful, right? The vast majority of the time, they work the same way. You should think of them as the same thing. This looks very much like our previous slide, right? These are, instead of, instead of types, we now have functions. And what does this print? Remember, we're using the, the correctly subsuming version. Anyone want to guess what this prints? C. Awesome. And it actually fits on the slide this time, so doubly awesome. All right, now let's get into the trick. So if you're like committee veteran, you've probably been pretty bored here. This is all stuff that like we understand. Maybe you're collecting some good like ways to teach this in the future, but uh, you've seen all of this. If you're new, great. I hope you're still here for the journey. Um, this talk is definitely designed to include you, so. Let's talk about this. Let's, here's, here's the programming challenge. And if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to pause right now. Like, look at this challenge. I'm gonna actually put up the next uh, slide, so hopefully you haven't already paused. But like, here are some examples of how I'd want this to work. Um, and like, here's the challenge. Um, and like, I can imagine you wouldn't do this in real code, but it's entirely possible that the situation, the ways to address this would come up in real code for some reason or another, right? Um, so let's write a class template, odd detector, with a single template parameter and a member function print that prints odd if the class template's parameter is itself a template with an odd number of template parameters and nope otherwise, right? So what do I mean by that? Like, here's like, say this, this type foo, and we want this odd detector class template to print odd if we give it something with an odd number of template parameters and to print nope otherwise. So either if we give it something that's, that's not a template, like int, or we give it something that has two template parameters. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like something specific, it could be anything. Who wants to, who's 
who's following along closely enough to guess why I use std future here instead of like say std vector or std set. Yes, their std future is probably the most common type I could come up with in the standard library or widely known that doesn't have any default template parameters. So this, you know. Uh, yes, the complex would have been a good one, but unfortunately doesn't have an odd number of template parameters, so couldn't have shown that. Yes, std complex is actually probably a, a good example. Wait, does std complex? Std complex does have an odd number of template uh, parameters. It has one. Ha ha. Um, hopefully you haven't already commented about how I was wrong on the YouTube video. Um, so here's a possible answer, right? Uh, and this uses the original trick. So here's our examples. I'm going to put them up, back up on the screen so that we can look. Here's what the primary template looks like, right? Primary templates are easy to write. They look like normal templates. Um, and here's what the partial specialization looks like, right? So we are going to deduce a template template. Um, so if you haven't seen a template template in regular code, hopefully it works like you'd expect it to. Um, but also you're lucky, because that means that you've worked in good code bases where people don't do stupid stuff like this. Um, and again, sometimes it's the thing you have to do because of the situation you're in. I'm not saying that like, you should never do this. Um, I'm saying that you should assess the complexity of the situation, assess the trade-offs of doing it differently, and determine what would make your code more maintainable, right? And um, if you do have to do this, this is how you do it, right? This is how you deduce a template in a context like this, right? Um, and so, and we're deducing a parameter pack, right? And then here's the expression or the pattern that we're matching as our partial specialization, right? It has our deduced template and our deduced parameter pack. And then we're just constraining our partial specialization on this, on size of arcs, mod two being one, right? So that's, that's just another way of saying odd, right? Um, and it's a Boolean expression, right? So we can put it after requires, right? This is the, this is the first type of requires that like introduces a constraint, uh, it introduces a constraint that is a Boolean expression, right? If I wanted to have a, an explicit constraint here that involved expressions, I'd have to say requires requires, right? But in this case, this is already a Boolean, so I don't need to make it into a Boolean. I can just give it directly. Um, hopefully people follow that, um, more or less. You, you have a question? This is 22. This, this is 20. Um, yeah, 23 standard hasn't been approved yet. So, like, don't get excited. Maybe it won't happen. Um, ha, ha, ha. Committee members joking, uh, it's going to happen. But um, officially, maybe it won't happen. Um, Herb's going to get all kinds of mad at me for being like, maybe it won't happen. Ha, ha, it will. Uh, but, yeah. Um, Okay, hopefully this shows up enough. I wasn't sure if this color is, would show up enough. But let's do the same challenge. Remember, we just talked about how overloading is very similar to partial specialization. So we're basically just going to do the same challenge, except for with functions instead of a class template. So examples, right? Odd detector is now instead a function, right? Um, and how would we write this? Like, if you didn't get the first one right and you paused the video and tried it, hopefully I've done a good enough job of explaining the analogy well enough that you should be able to go back and look at the first answer and write the second answer from it, right? So this answer, and I say possible answer because like anything in C++, there are multiple ways to do this. Um, I'm going to show you what I think is the cutest way to do it, which you probably shouldn't do in real code, but maybe illustrate something about how concepts work. Um, and Here's the um, unconstrained overload, right? So that's the analog of what we called the primary template, right? This is an unconstrained overload. The difference is that with functions, you don't have to have an unconstrained overload, whereas with templates, you do have to have a primary template. Now, the primary template doesn't have to have a definition. There's sometimes when you, in fact, want to have the primary template not have a definition so you don't accidentally compile it. Um, but in overloads, you don't even have to have a primary template, or the analog of a primary template, which is an unconstrained overload, right? Here we have an unconstrained overload that prints out nope, and 
basically the same constraint here, right? We're pattern matching in exactly the same way. Um, if I'm being pedantic, this should be a reference. This should be a reference so that we don't have none of them match um, non-copyable types. This actually doesn't work for std future because that's a non-copyable type. Um, so typo in the answer, but um, it's not in the next answer as a typo, so hopefully. All right, challenge number two. This gets to the root of the complaint people have about concepts that this original trick was about, right? It's that if you can't partially specialize a concept, how the heck am I supposed to write a concept that expresses this constraint, right? How am I supposed to write a concept that will only match this, right? Because I need to know that something is a template. So I need to be able to like deduce these pieces out of the partial specialization, like pull them out of the partial specialization somehow, right? We're kind of like pattern matching in order to get names for things. If you follow my tweets a lot, you'll see that I talk a lot about, here's how we get names for this thing. And that's what I mean by that is really this, right? We have something that matches a pattern with one name and we need a way to give uh, two names to parts of that pattern, right? And, and, and have them, and, and be able to, to talk about them, right? We also need to have like this name be a pack so that we can talk about its size, right? We need this name to be a template so that we can match that part, right? So this is like decomposing one name into two names, right? And partial specialization is typically the way you do that, right? And um, so we can't do that with concepts. So like, I think my immediate reaction was, oh no, we're stuck. I have to like defer to this old thing that kind of looks like enable if, right? Um, what you'd like to be able to do is, is this, but it doesn't compile. Anyone guess why we decided this shouldn't compile? Concepts are hard. Like that's the end of this, right? Like the same reason why we would have liked that, that addable and basic addable thing earlier to have just worked without having to mention explicitly what the, what the base concept is, that's, it's too hard, right? You end up with problems that are, um, somebody can link in the comments to like this proof, but you end up essentially, as I understand it, with problems that are equivalent to um, NP-complete problems like SAT. Um, and so if you are in this constrained environment where you have to be explicit about things, uh, like I said in the previous slide, you don't end up with something that is equivalent to the SAT problem. Um, and likewise, we don't support partial specialization of concepts because things get complicated. Um, so like, we'd like to be able to do this. How do we do the equivalent of this, right? C++ is a toolbox. You can make a hammer out of like a large enough screwdriver and like elbow grease, right? Um, so let's, let's try this again. We, we could use a class template partial specialization, right? Remember concepts are just Booleans. So we can create like this impl concept or impl class template. We have a primary template here that has this value equals false and we have a partial specialization that has the value equals true. And uh, we do this. This is probably the most straightforward way to do this. Okay, five minutes left, awesome. This is probably the most straightforward way to do this and if you've had, if you've seen someone having to do this in code, this is probably how they did it. And great, that's, if it's the most intuitive way, this is probably how you should do it. I'm gonna show you some other ways to do it um, that maybe are cuter and might suit your code base for one reason or another. Um, we could just use a function, right? So going back to challenge 1B, we can, here's our function, except for we just left off the unspecialized version, right? And we don't need a definition either. Um, and then we just basically have a concept that has a requires clause that says that this function has to be a valid substitution, right? And because we don't have the unspecialized overload here, it will only be a valid substitution if um, this overload is valid, right? If challenge 1B had printed odd. So we've created a concept here. But what if, for whatever reason, we wanted to do all of this inline? And this gets us back to the original trick, right? This is, we can do this with a lambda, right? Remember, lambdas are like functions. And because in C20, we can give explicit template parameters 
to a lambda, we can do the same thing that we did with this. Um, this is the code from the previous slide, if you can't see it. But uh, with this function in the previous slide, and just stick it inside the concept. Now note, as I promised earlier, um, this, the body of a lambda in a concept, in a requires clause, is not a spin safe context. Anything in here has to compile unconditionally, regardless of what you substitute into here, right? So if you substitute into here something that causes this body to not compile, that's not a substitution error, that's just an error. Um, so this body of this function, if you use this pattern, should be empty. Um, but I stuck a requires clause on this lambda, which looks exactly like the requires clause on this, um, on this function here, right? And now you see why I've been using requires clauses this whole time and not switching between the short notation and the long notation. Here, if we want to do this inline, right, this is, we want a requires clause. Um, so the general pattern that you shouldn't use, um, I'm going to flash this up on the screen quickly because I'm running out of time, but basically, yeah, you can you stick your primary, primary template parameters here, you t stick L value references to them here, and then you call the lambda with those L value references, you stick your partial specialization parameters here, you put L value references to those patterns here, right? And then you have constraints inside of this requires clause and you can use these new names, right? This is just a fancy way of creating new names from less complicated names. And so much of generic programming and template metaprogramming, which are separate things, in C++ um, is about figuring out ways to find new names for things, right? So like, if you can start to think of problems of how to write things in terms of trying to find a new name for part of the thing, um, then maybe you can start trying to apply these tricks to build up these kinds of things. Here's a more general pattern. Uh, you could do this by joining requires clauses with overloads to have multiple partial specializations. Uh, even more general pattern. Um, this. Can someone tell me really quickly off the top of their head why this is wrong and doesn't mirror partial specialization exactly? Not, does not, not because it short circuits. What happens if I have an ambiguity here? Does this fail like it should? No. So we could do this by collecting overloads. This is a, pat, this is a um, cute trick that you'll see in, some of, in another one of my tweets and from other people. It's original to, I think, Louis Dion or before that. Somebody said it was Ben Dean, I don't know. Uh, those are awesome people, you should definitely go shake their hands at conferences if you see either of them. Um, for actual partial specialization semantics, you could do this, right? Just stick this overloads thing in here, um, and now exactly one of them has to match. You've mirrored, um, essentially, partial specialization of a concept semantics uh, using overloads, and this is why I wanted to draw that analogy. Um, these last two slides, I'm going through them very quickly, but they're more for the people who kind of knew most of the middle material, but are like, wow, show me something new. Um, come back and reference them on the YouTube video. Why you should basically never use this pattern, then I'll wrap up. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, but this is, this is to some extent important, right? I hear people say this, like, I want a concept for a vector of things that work with the plus operator. And my question is, do you really, uh, like, rethink your life decisions, maybe? Um, but, but seriously, like, jokes aside, like, when are you writing a library that is so generic that you don't know anything about the, the type of the, vec of the element in the vector except that it has a plus operator? But you know something so specific about the container that you know it is std vector exactly. Like, this is an odd mix of generic and specific. And it means you're probably, it's like a, it's a, it's, it's a code smell. Right. Um, I hate the term code smell because it's like a non-specific way of saying you're wrong. But um, in, in a sense, like maybe you should be thinking about what you're doing there and mixing generic with specific is maybe not great. But right, like my original trick was showing how to do this, right? You have this constraint on, on T and then you could stick this vector of addable here in this, this overload. But um, if you do really want to do this, Here's two ways you could do it. 
right? Just constrain the template parameter to be addable, right? Deduce this template parameter, um, and then leave the vector in the parameter explicitly and, and make this addable. Um, or look at the container itself and say that the object I'm getting out of the container needs to be addable, but don't be specific about it being a vector um, unless you have a reason to. Um, yeah, and that's it. That's, that's all I have. Um, I'll take questions during the break, unfortunately, and then I'll try and like summarize them in tweets or something if I get some interesting ones in there. Um, but I went way over time. It was exactly one cute trick, so maybe I should have taken the plural out. Um, but I hope that like this deep dive was really helpful. I genuinely um, like want to teach real C++ with this fake joke C++ that I do. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. So thanks.